Welcome to the Wisdom That Breathes channel. Across all our platforms, we try to share wisdom which is relevant and accessible to everyone. But on this particular platform, we go deeper into some of the ancient principles found within the scriptures. If you find some of the terminology difficult or inaccessible, then go over to our Keshava Swami YouTube channel where you'll be able to find other content which is perhaps more relatable. Thank you and enjoy the wisdom that breathes. Hare Krishna. So thank you everyone for coming this morning. Before I begin, I beg for the permission of all my seniors and all the Vaishnavas here that I can share something with you. Today is a very deep day of reflection. Today is the disappearance of Sri Jiva Goswami. Sri Jiva Goswami, Prabhupada, Ki. So we'll discuss uh, something about his life and his legacy and his pastimes and his incredible contribution to the Sampradaya and to our own lives. So this morning we'll read from the Madhya Lila of the Chaitanya Charitamrita and today we're reading from text number 34. So if you can repeat after me. Prabhu Agyai Koyle Shabha Shastrira Vichar Prabhu Agyai Koyle Shabha Shastrira Vichar Prajirani Guda Bhakti Korila Prachar Prajirani Guda Bhakti Prajirani Guda Bhakti Korila Prachar Prajirani Guda Bhakti Agyai Koyle Shabha Shastri Ravichar Rajirani Guda Bhakti Korila Prachar Rajirani Guda Bhakti Korila Prachar Agyai Koyle Shabha Shastri Ravichar Rajirani Guda Bhakti Korila Prachar Rajirani Guda Bhakti Korila Prachar Upon the order of Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Kaila, they did Shabha Sastrera of all scriptures, Vichar, analytical study, Vrajera of Sri Vrindavan Dham, Niguda, most confidential. Bhakti, devotional service, Karila, did, Prachar, preaching. Translation and purple by His Divine Grace, Lacey Bhakti Vedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Translation. The Goswamis carried out the preaching work of devotional service on the basis of an analytical study of all confidential Vedic literatures. This was in compliance with the order of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. 
Thus one can understand the most confidential devotional service of Vrindavan purport. This proves that bona fide devotional service is based on the conclusions of the Vedic literature. It is not based on the type of sentiment exhibited by the Prakrita Sahajyas. The Prakrita Sahajyas do not consult the Vedic literatures and they are debauchees, woman hunters and smokers of ganja. Sometimes they give a theatrical performance and cry for the Lord with tears in their eyes. Of course, all scriptural conclusions are washed off by these tears. The Prakrita Sahajyas do not realize that they are violating the orders of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who specifically said that to understand Vrindavan and the pastimes of Vrindavan, one must have sufficient knowledge of the Shastras, script, Vedic literatures. As stated in Srimad Bhagavatam 1.2.12, Bhaktiya Shruta Grihitaya. This means that devotional service is acquired from Vedic knowledge. Tatradadana Munaya, devotees who are actually serious, attain bhakti, scientific devotional service, by hearing Vedic literatures. Bhaktiya Shruta Grihitaya. It is not that one should create something out of sentimentality, become a sahajya and advocate such concocted devotional service. However, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur considered that sahajyas, such, such sahajyas to be more favorable than impersonalists who are hopelessly atheistic. The impersonalists have no idea of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The position of the Sahajyas is far better than that of the Mayavadi sannyasis. Although the Sahajyas do not think much of Vedic knowledge, they nonetheless have accepted Lord Krishna as the Supreme Lord. Unfortunately, they mislead others from authentic devotional service. Srila Prabhupada Ki Om Ajnanati Mirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yutapadakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatham Pitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Dalita Shri Vishakam Vitamscha he Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Chakat Pate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namaskate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Vishabhano Sude Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpataru Bhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhyadevacha Patitanam Pahane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Nama Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasudhi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Shri Prabhupada Ki Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami here is explaining that the Goswamis of Vrindavan are the ones who are giving us access to Vraja Bhakti. 
the Goswamis are revealing how to enter into the deepest pastimes of Krishna. Sometimes it is said that the Srimad Bhagavatam is revealing the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Ete chamsha kala pumsha krishnastu bhagavan svayam So the Srimad Bhagavatam is revealing who is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But when the Goswamis commentate on Srimad Bhagavatam, then they are revealing who is the Supreme Personality of Krishna. Yes, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but Krishna is having many, many different personalities. So which of the personalities of Krishna is the Supreme One? That is revealed by the Goswamis of Vrindavan. Shyama meva padam rupam puri madhu puri vada vaya kaishora kam dhyayam adya eva paro rasa Shyama meva padam rupam If you want to know what is the padam rupam, the most exalted form of Krishna, Shyama, Shyam Sunda, Krishna. Puri madhu puri vada And if you want to know where that Shyam is performing his most uh, incredible pastimes, Puri Madhu Puri Vara, that is Vrindavan. And in Vrindavan, Shyam has many, many different stages that he goes through. Vaya Keshaurakam Dhyayam. But the superlative uh, personality of Shyam is coming out, Keshaura, when he is a youth. And Adya Eva Parol Rasa. As a youth in Vrindavan, in that form of Shyam, he is performing his most intensely loving pastimes with the gopis of Vrindavan in the Adiras, the Madhurya Ras, the Ras of sweetness. So this is all revealed by the Goswamis of Vrindavan. It is latent within the Bhagavatam. But the Goswamis, through their teachings, they are actually teaching the essence of the essence. The Bhagavatam is already the essence. Sarve Vedanta Sadam hi Srimad Bhagavatam Ishyate Tadra Samrita Triptasya Na Anyatra Shyadra Dikvachit it's mentioned that Sarve Vedanta Sar, if you want to know what is the essence of all the Vedanta, then Srimad Bhagavatam Ishyate. Bhagavatam is presenting that essence. But in order to understand that essence, the Goswamis, they are drawing out what is the highest knowledge. Therefore, the Goswamis are masterminds. They are masterminds, number one, because they have mastered their own mind. But they are masterminds, number two, because they have understood the mind of their master. Sri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam. See, if you don't do one, you can't do two. If you don't conquer your own mind, you will never be able to understand the mind of your master. Jitatmana prashantasya paramatma samahita, Krishna says. For one who has conquered the mind, the super soul is already reached. So most people, they cannot understand, uh, understand the mind of their master because their own mind is too loud. Therefore, I think someone, maybe Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he said, I have four disciples, my two hands and my two legs. Everyone else is hearing me, but because their mind is too loud, they can't actually grasp what I'm telling them to do. So the Goswamis are masterminds because number one, they've mastered their own minds. Therefore, number two, They've understood the mind of their master. But number three, they are masterminds because they know how to masterfully reach the mind of every living entity. 
Because they can communicate something. It's one thing to know something. But it's quite something else to be able to communicate that to someone else in a way that it will penetrate their heart and transform their life. And that's what the Goswamis did. They were able to communicate the highest theology in a way that even people today in Kali Yuga are reading and experiencing the highest states of spiritual consciousness. That's amazing. That is incredible. Therefore, they are masterminds because they documented everything. You see, every generation in the parampara is adding something unique to the equation. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he is displaying Krishna Bhakti, isn't it? Prem ras mir yas karite ashvadhan raga marga bhakti loke karita prachan Mahaprabhu is coming and he is prem uh, ras mir yas karite ashvadhan He's tasting it, he's displaying prema bhakti and therefore everyone is seeing this incredible love that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has. So Mahaprabhu, he is displaying Prema Bhakti. But then in the next generation, the Goswamis, they are documenting Prema Bhakti. Bhakta Bhakti Krishna Prem Tatvera Nidhar Vaishnavera Kritya Ar Vaishnava Achar Mahaprabhu told them, write down all the tattva of who is a devotee, what is bhakti, who is Bhagavan, and what is the character and activities of a Vaishnava. You have to write it all down. Therefore, Mahaprabhu was displaying Prema Bhakti, but the Goswamis, they were documenting Prema Bhakti. But then in the next generation, Jiva Goswami had three Shiksha disciples, Shamananda, Naratham and Srinivas. And what were they doing? They knew also the mind of their master, Prithivite Achayata, Nagaradigram. It has to go, it cannot stay, it must spread. Therefore they distributed Prema Bhakti. And in this way, through Bengal, through Orissa, through every town and village in the vicinity of these areas, Prema Bhakti was being spread. <coughs> so then later on, in the 17th century, Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur appeared as the follower of those illustrious personalities. Vishwanath Chakravati, his name means uh, one who reveals the jewel of devotion to Vishwanath and one who therefore then goes and expands the circle of bhakti. Such a beautiful name. So he said that Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, he deepened the understanding of Prema Bhakti through his commentaries, through his writings, through his realizations. He was a representative, some say an incarnation of Rupa Goswami. And then in the 18th century, Baladev Vidya Bhusan, he defended Prema Bhakti. Because there was a accusation, there was a challenge that the Gaudiya Sampradaya, how you call yourself a Sampradaya? Every Sampradaya must have a commentary on Vedanta Sutra. So where is your commentary? The Gaudiyas were telling them, no, Brahma Sutra Nam, Srimad Bhagavatam is the natural commentary. We don't require any other commentary. Galitam Phalam is the ripened fruit. But they would not accept Baladev Vidya Bhusan therefore wrote a commentary on Vedanta Sutra which was dictated to him by Govindaji, which later on became known as Govinda Bhasya. Therefore, Baladevidya Bhusan in the 18th century 
defended Prema Bhakti. And then in the 19th and 20th century, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, Srila Prabhupada, they delivered Prema Bhakti to the whole world, Paschatya Deshatarine, delivering all the Western worlds. So, in a snapshot, because our memories in Kali Yuga are little declining. If you want to know the summary of the parampara, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu displayed Prema Bhakti. The Goswamis documented Prema Bhakti. The three followers of Jiva Goswami distributed Prema Bhakti. Later on, Vishwanath Chakravati came and deepened Prema Bhakti. Baladev Vidyabhusan then later on defended Prema Bhakti. And then our contemporary Acharyas delivered Prema Bhakti to the whole world. It's a transcendental conspiracy. <laughs> because every generation is adding something unique to the equation which is then ultimately there to fulfill the desire of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So the Goswamis of Vrindavan were the ones who documented, they wrote profusely, Nada Shastra Vicharane Gunipuno Sadharma Sanstapako Lokanam Hitakarino Tribhuvane Manyo Sharanyakaro they studied so many things. See, first problem for us is we don't have access to all the Shastra. Not only do we not have physical access, we don't have access because we don't know Sanskrit. We can't uh, read. We can't actually grasp. So the first problem is a problem of access. But even tomorrow, if we had access, the second problem would be, we have no patience. <coughs> Isn't it? Just like all year round, we're thinking, well, I'm thinking, I just want to be in Vrindavan. I just want to study, read Bhagavatam. And then we come to Vrindavan with nothing else to do apart from reading. And after two hours, the mind is becoming restless because we don't have the patience. Prayena Vaishaha Sabhya, always disturbed. So the second problem is we have no patience. But the third problem is even if you had access to all the Shastra and you had all the patience to read it, the third problem is Sumanda Matayo, no intelligence. So what you will do, you can read and read all day and after the end of the day, you will still be wondering what it's all about. You won't understand the essence. So you see, Nana Shastra Vicharane Kunipuno Sadharma Sanstapako The Goswamis, they went in, they got the access. They were so patient to study. Jiva Goswami spent one year in Benares, Varanasi. When Mahaprabhu told Tapan Mishra to go Varanasi, Tapan Mishra said, Are you crazy? What will I do in Varanasi? It's the place of Mayavadis. There's no rasa, there's no taste, there's no Krishna Katha, there's no Sankirtan. How I will stay for so, much, so long in Varanasi? Mahaprabhu said, don't worry, we'll find you some association. So then later on, Mahaprabhu came and he converted all the Mayavadi sannyasis. There you go. <laughs> Got some association now. Even when Mahaprabhu went first time, before he uh, converted Prakashananda Saraswati, he said, I came here with so many fruits to give, but there's no one. So you can imagine, Varanasi is not an easy place to be for a bhakta. There's no rasa, there's no taste. But Jiva Goswami, he was so patient. Do you know that before he came to Vrindavan to fulfill the mission of Mahaprabhu, 
He spent one year in Varanasi. And there he learned all the Saddarshan, Sanskrit. He learned everything he required in order to preach and deliver the teachings to the world. So the Goswamis went in, they got access, they were very, very patient. And then through their transcendental intelligence, they were able to reveal to the world what is the essence of it all. So the Goswamis were Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's own Antaranga Bhaktas, his own Parishads, his eternal associates. Mahaprabhu was traveling and he was meeting the Goswamis one by one. You know who was the first Goswami to meet? Mahaprabhu? Raghunath Bhatta? Some say, but actually it seems that the first one to meet Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was Raghunath Das Goswami. Because Mahaprabhu took sannyas in Katwa, he wanted to go to Vrindavan. Nityananda Prabhu said, don't worry, trust me, I'll take you. And he didn't. He brought Mahaprabhu to Shantipur. And in Shantipur for 10 days they had a great festival. And at that time it said that 15 year old Raghunath Das Goswami came to Mahaprabhu. And he said, I want to join you. I want to give up everything. And Mahaprabhu said, don't be a madman. Go back, do your duties. And when the time is right, you can come. So Raghunath Das Goswami first met Mahaprabhu. Then Mahaprabhu came to Puri. Then Mahaprabhu was traveling in South India. In South India, Mahaprabhu stopped at Sri Rangam. And in Sri Rangam, he stayed in the house of Vyankata Bhatta. And Vyankata Bhatta's son was Gopal Bhatta. So Gopal Bhatta was the second one who met Mahaprabhu. Mahaprabhu finished his South India tour. He reached Puri again and then he said, I want to go to Vrindavan. So he set off to go to Vrindavan, but before going to Vrindavan, he went via Ramakali. And in Ramakali, he met Rupa, Sanatan and Jiva Goswami. This is when Mahaprabhu uh, initiated Rupa and Sanatan. Ajay hoye te dunhar naam Rupa Sanatan. Denya chadi denya tomar. Fate raman. Ajay hoye te dunhar naam. From this day on your names will be Rupa Sanatan. Dainya Chadi, give up your humility. Dainya Tomar, because your humility is so deep. Fatih Mora Man is breaking my heart. That's amazing. So, Mahaprabhu met Jiva, Rupa, Sanatan. Sanatan told Mahaprabhu, You're followed by so many people. Now you should not go to Vrindavan, you should go back to Puri. So Mahaprabhu came back to Puri. And then Mahaprabhu decided, no, no, I must go to Vrindavan. Uh, let me go a different route this time. So this time Mahaprabhu went via Varanasi. And in Varanasi, remember Mahaprabhu had sent Tapan Mishra to Varanasi. And Tapan Mishra's son was... Raghunath Bhatta. So there Mahaprabhu met Raghunath Bhatta. Fourth meeting. So this is how Mahaprabhu met all of the six Goswamis in this order. And when he met them, he instilled them with this spirit of renunciation and this spirit to dedicate themselves to living in Vrindavan and revealing uh, all the knowledge for generations to come. So Mahaprabhu gave different instructions to the Goswamis. Bhakta Bhakti Krishna Prem Tatvera Nidhar Vaishnavera Kritya Ara Vaishnava Achar Krishna Bhakti Krishna Prem Seva Pravartan Lupta Tirtha Udara Ara Vairagya Shikshan Mahaprabhu told them write books, show the ideal character, excavate the holy places, 
become the ideal renunciates and establish temples where people can come and worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So these were the different instructions given to the Goswamis. And so they were combining together, six of them. The first person who brings these six Goswamis together as a unit is found in the earliest writings of Naratam Das Thakur. He talks about Chai Goswami, uh, the six Goswamis. And later on, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, he makes the six Goswamis and them as a unit much more known to the world through the Chaitanya Charitamrita. But basically what happened is at one point, five of the Goswamis, they all left the world in quick succession. And therefore, on Jiva Goswami's shoulders was a huge responsibility to continue on the legacy of uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his, uh, his parents, his, four, four, uh, his predecessors. So it was a huge responsibility on Jiva Goswami's shoulders. There is one South Indian Acharya, Pillalokai Acharya, Pillai Lokacharya. And he says, you can know a disciple who is a real disciple because they do three things. The real disciple of the Guru does these three things. The first thing is he preserves the physical assets of the spiritual master. That means the temples, the projects, the, uh, the different physical things that the spiritual master establishes in the world, they ensure that is preserved. The second thing the disciple must do is they must preserve the intellectual assets of the spiritual master, the teachings, the books, the uh, instructions for the world. And the third thing that the bona fide disciple must do is carry forward the mood, the personality, the fame of the spiritual master. If you find the disciple does these three things, you can understand they are actually a disciple. And Jiva Goswami did these things perfectly. The first thing he did was he maintained the physical assets of his predecessors. All these temples had been established in Vrindavan. But this time in the world, in the 16th century, was a very volatile time because it was the Mughal Empire. And therefore Vrindavan was subject to so many attacks, so much pillaging. Uh, the wealth, the jewels of Vrindavan, the jewels that the deities were decorated with were naturally causing many conquerors to look at Vrindavan as a place where they could come. So Jiva Goswami, he actually expertly ensured that all of these temples would be maintained. He made connections with the Rajputs. He made legal agreements. Even today, I think, if you go to Vrindavan Institute, you can see Jiva Goswami has been writing wills of how all of these temples will be maintained. So, Jiva Goswami was maintaining. Uh, all of these temples are here because of Jiva Goswami's ingenuity in how to maintain the physical assets of his spiritual master. But then Jiva Goswami also maintained the intellectual assets because he was writing profusely. We'll talk about this. And Jiva Goswami also maintained the mood, uh, the fame of his teachers by doing exactly what they did. The Goswamis were incredible because they played many, many roles. They were managers. But at the same time, they were leaders. But at the same time, they were teachers. But at the same time, they were pujaris. They were able to do all of these things simultaneously. Isn't it? Generally, you find someone can do maybe one. 
good speaker, but don't invite him to the meeting. Useless manager. <laughs> it's okay, Prabhu, you don't, come, you, you don't come to the meeting. You just stay in the class. You preach. <laughs> so some people, they can, or someone, great writer, great writer, but can't do anything practical. So we can usually only do one of these things, but the Goswamis, Jiva Goswami, they were doing all of these things, playing all of these roles simultaneously. Amazing people. Clearly, very exalted Mahapurush, great personality. But amongst everything that Jiva Goswami did, perhaps Jiva Goswami's greatest contribution was his teachings. Sometimes Jiva Goswami is known as the Tattva Acharya, the teacher in the Gaudiya Sampradaya who elucidated and communicated Tattva like nobody else. If Rupa Goswami is the Rasa Acharya, if uh, Haridas Thakur is the Namacharya, then we glorify Jiva Goswami for being the Tattva Acharya. Rupa Goswami wrote 100,000 verses, but Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, he says Jiva Goswami wrote 400,000 verses. And you just think about that for a second. The Bhagavatam is 18,000 verses, and you know how much shelf space that takes up. <laughs> so now, times that by 20, 25. That's how much Jiva Goswami wrote. In fact, Bhakti Radnakar says he lists over 25 books that he wrote, 400,000 verses. This means. If Jiva Goswami wrote 400,000 verses, it means there's only one personality in the Sampradaya who wrote more than him. You know who that is, right? Vyasadeva. <laughs> if Jiva Goswami wrote 400,000 verses, that means the only personality who wrote more than him is Vyasadeva himself. So Jiva Goswami was writing all, of, and, and his books were not just, he was writing all kinds of books. He was writing commentaries. Then he was writing philosophical works. Then he was writing manuals. Then he was writing Leela, like Gopal Champu. These amazing people. He, he, he played so many different roles and within one role he was able to do so many different things, isn't it? If someone is an author, maybe they can write one type of book. He wrote all the types of books. So inconceivable. And somehow in all of his books, he was bringing the essence. Sadharma, Sanstapa, Go. He was bringing out the essence. Even he writes a book on Sanskrit grammar, Harinama Amrita Vyakarana. And Prabhupada writes in the Chaitanya Charitamrita that you can become a Krishna conscious person by reading this grammar book. Because what does he do, like, is very interesting. What he does is, for example, in this grammar book, he calls the vows Sarveshvara. So vowels are known as Sarveshvara. Sarveshvara means the controller of everything. So in language, you can't do anything without a vowel, isn't it? Without vowels, you can't do anything. So he calls the vowels, he gives it a name of Krishna, Sarveshvara. Then he says, short vowels are known as Vamana. <laughs> because Vamana is a But when that same vowel becomes a long vowel, then it becomes Trivikrama. Because when Vamana 
extends to three steps to cover everything, then he's known as Trivikrama. So vowels are known as Sarveshvara. Short vowels are known as Vamana. Long vowels are known as Trivikrama. And consonants are known as Vishnujana. Vishnujana means they are dependent on Vishnu. Consonants are dependent. They can't do anything unless there is a vowel. They can't do anything without Sarveshvara. <coughs> Therefore the consonant is Vishnu Jan. <laughs> Subjects of Vishnu. It's very interesting. <laughs> Prabhupada said you can become a Krishna conscious person just by learning the grammar of Harinama Mrita Vyakarana. So this is a genius, genius person. Uh, Jiva Goswami. So, here in today's verse of Chaitanya Charitamrita, Srila Prabhupada is mentioning the point that sometimes people try to approach very exalted states of bhakti, but they don't spend time understanding Siddhanta, they don't spend time learning Tattva, they don't take the effort to read all of the systematic Shastra that has been given by Jiva Goswami. Later on in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Krishna Das Raj Goswami will say, Siddhanta Baliya Jite Nakara Alash Iha Hoite Krishna Lage Sudrida Manash Siddhanta Baliya Jite Nakara Alash when it comes to understanding Siddhanta philosophy, nakara alash, don't be lazy, don't be, uh, don't shortcut. Because iha hoite, by doing this, Krishna lage sudrida manash, the mind becomes very, very steady. If one learns bhakti shastra, from the right type of person, then their mind will become so strong that practicing sadhana and fixing the mind on Krishna will become much easier. Otherwise, Janchalam Himana Krishna Pramati Balabhadridam. Otherwise, very difficult. One devotee said, my mind during the Japa time is like a horror movie. <laughs> yes, the mind will be like a horror movie. So, but then when we understand scripture very deeply, Sudrita Maharaj, the mind becomes steady. So, there must be proper Siddhanta. You see, if there is upper Siddhanta, then later on there will be Appa Sampradaya. And from Appa Sampradaya there will be Appa Rad. Appa Siddhanta means Appa Sampradaya, which means Appa Rad, distance from Radharani. You think you're going closer, but actually you're distancing because Shruti Shmriti Puranadi Pancharat Bidhindrina Ekatiki Hare Bhakti if you try to practice bhakti, but you don't do it in reference to Shruti, Shmriti, Puranadi, Pacharatra, if you don't reference the Shastra, then we'll miss the opportunity. So, Jiva Goswami was not just a great philosopher, but he had incredible character. And when you put these two things together, then one becomes the most learned personality. Because Krishna says, Jnana is useless unless you're free from envy. Isn't it? Anashu Yave, Krishna says. So jnana has to be accompanied by non-enviousness. So what is it said of the six Goswamis? Dhira dhira jana priyo priyakaro nirmatsaro 
Pujit Ever if they had no envy. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, knowledge has to be accompanied by uh, gentleness, humility, vidya, vinaya, shampane. So the Goswamis were so gentle, they were so humble. Buddha, Dina, Ganesha, Go, Karunaya, Dina, they always felt themselves very low. Krishna says, knowledge is useless unless you practice some tapasya. Idam te na tapashkaya na bhaktaya kadachana. So what were the Goswamis doing? Nidra, hara, vihara, kadi, vijito, chityanta, dhamadino, chayo. They were curtailing all demands of the body. So like this, it's not just that Jiva Goswami was an incredible mastermind. It's not just that he had some amazing intelligence, but he had very, very refined character. And because of these two things together, his influence is basically unparalleled. So the Goswamis are so important for us. Srila Prabhupada writes a letter and he says, now we have this Vrindavan center. I want 25 devotees who are just as exemplary as the Goswamis to reside here. And then the project will be a success. So Prabhupada said, we want 25 devotees who are just like the Goswamis to manage the Vrindavan temple. So the Goswamis become our role models. If we study Sat Goswami Ashtakam, then we understand uh, what kind of character we're trying to develop. And especially what character living in Vrindavan, because they were living here. So we're so fortunate, Srila Prabhupada has given us access to all these great personalities. Uh, now Srila Prabhupada is saying, don't be lazy, don't waste the opportunity, study. Uh, you must uh, understand the conclusions given by the Goswamis, then uh, Raja Bhakti will become uh, very much accessible and achievable by the divine grace of the Acharyas Mahajana Yena Gata Sapanta. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, maybe I should have done. Anyone has any uh, question? Or So it was a lovely class on uh, Jiva Goswami. So uh, uh, in the purport of uh, this verse of Chaitanya Chaitanya, it was mentioned that uh, like uh, Sahajiyas are better than uh, uh, Mayavadis in the sense that they have accepted Supreme Lord as the Supreme Personality of God, Krishna. Uh, at this, and like, so as far as I remember, correct me if I am wrong, like, uh, we can uh, offer our respects to uh, Mayavadi sannyasis since they are following for regulatory principles and uh, in terms of like moral character they are high that way. So what do your what should be our disposition towards Sahajiyas? Like uh, what should we take? Just respect them from a distance or should not respect them? Like we can't it's, it's difficult to respect them because uh, moral character is gone. So what should be our disposition? Well, what to speak of Sahajya, Zamanina, Manadeina, Ketaniya, Sadahani. We offer respects to everyone. That doesn't mean we follow everyone. That doesn't mean we learn from everyone. But we try to see the good in everyone. Even a broken clock tells the right time twice a day. <laughs> So 
So we must see if there is some good, at least they are chanting Krishna's names, at least they are somewhat thinking of Krishna. Of course, they are, uh, their tears are different tears, wrong types of tears. There is the cry of the samsarika, the one who is engaged, entangled in material life. Then there is the cry of the sahajya, the one who is shedding tears, but superficially for Krishna. Then there is the cry of the sadaka, the one who is sincerely trying to shed tears to reach Krishna. And then there is a cry of the sitha, the one in the spiritual world who is actually crying for Krishna. So in one sense at least they are crying. But the quality of those tears will not attract Krishna's attention. In fact, Srila Prabhupada says in the purports, their tears wash away all the scriptural conclusions. So we have to learn the art of how to cry for Krishna. His Holiness Govinda Maharaj would say, we are not opening temples, we are opening crying houses. Where you can learn the art of how to cry for Krishna. But to come here and just cry for Krishna, but to have no understanding of Krishna, to have no substance to one's devotion, those kind of tears. No. So our disposition is we see the good in everyone. But we don't follow, we don't need to uh, overly associate. If we have some opportunity to help, then we help. Otherwise, what to say? We have so many problems in our own life. Let's go ahead with that. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for the wonderful class. So Maharaj, uh, in the class you emphasized uh, on knowledge and character and one of the instructions Mahaprabhu gave to the Goswamis was to, you know, to, I think you mentioned about character there also. And my question is, knowledge and character, do they complement each other? Because sometimes we see people having enough knowledge but when we see their character, we question, does he, is, is he really knowledgeable? And sometimes, you know, we see people, they don't have sufficient knowledge, but if you see them as a person, as a personality, we can make out both. He is a person of character. So how, how like, what is the relation between the knowledge and character? Is it, they, do they complement each other? Yes. When one becomes knowledgeable, then naturally their character should change. And when one's character changes, then naturally their heart becomes more fertile for the knowledge to go deeper. So both things are complementing each other. But then we must realize that we come to this movement with different conditionings. And those conditionings don't disappear immediately. You may have noticed. Take some time. So sometimes you'll find some people come to this movement and already they have very good uh, character. Some people are just naturally simple, naturally humble, naturally very gentle people. Whereas others, let's just say, are the opposite. So we may think, so, so we all start from a different point. And therefore sometimes we may say, oh, but this person's been practicing so long, but knows so many things, but their character, and this person is new, but, they can, but we're coming in with conditionings. But the point is, whatever conditionings we begin with, Ultimately, both must support each other. So yes, the more we study, the more we actually, uh, through that knowledge, Shrinvatam Svakatha Krishna Punyashra Kanakirtana Vidyanta Sto Hiyabhadrani 
Gidana Tisare Sitam. Yes, by all of that hearing, if one is actually hearing, then Abhadrani, uh, everything that is troublesome within the heart, uh, is almost completely destroyed. So it will happen, but it takes time. And yes, we have to work on our character. Sometimes there is a kind of this notion that I don't need to do anything, I just need to practice devotional service and all the good qualities of the demigods will automatically descend in my character. Yes, that's what the Bhagavatam does say in the fifth canto. Yes, yasti bhakti the bhagavantya kinchana sarve gune statra samasate suraha But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to cultivate good character in the stage of a sadhaka. Because if we're proud, and we just say, well, that's just the way I am. And we continue reading and chanting, not trying to curtail that tendency to be proud. Then the real humility will never descend because the power of the devotional service will never have uh, that effect. Therefore, we tell people, chant in a humble state of mind. So yes, these two things should complement each other. And when we see in someone that both things are not seemingly not complementing each other, then we should understand number one, it takes time. And number two, it also depends on the quality of the attention to both of those sides. Thank you for the beautiful class. Um, wondering because when we hear the glories of great personalities like Jiva Goswami, all of our acharyas, Srila Prabhupada, uh, sometimes we can think, oh, that was them, they're in a totally different category, I can never even come close to doing what they have done. Uh, and then I wonder, well, is that uh, artificial humility? Is that like self limits are we just limiting ourselves by saying that it's impossible for me to even come close to anything but you ended the class saying that there are role models so it seems that role model means somebody that you should try to try to do what they did try to as far as possible and follow their example so to what extent can we serve in that to that uh, amazing capacity and to what extent are we just totally hopelessly insignificant in comparison to them. Rupa Goswami says there is Anukarini and Anusharini. We can never do what Jiva Goswami did. And to try would be Anukarini, to try to imitate their activities. But what we can try to do is try to draw the spirit Try to understand the heart. Try to understand what is that inner mood. And by doing that, Anusharini, to understand the essence of what that personality stands for, we then turn to our own life with all our limitations and we say, how can I do the same? Jiva Goswami dedicated his life to sharing knowledge in a way with the world that he could reach them. You see, for example, Jiva Goswami writes the Sat Sandarbhas, Bhagavat Sandarbha. So the first, uh, so it's Tattva Sandarbha, then Bhagavat Sandarbha, then Paramatma Sandarbha, then Krishna Sandarbha, then Bhakti Sandarbha, then Priti Sandarbha. It's very amazing the strategy of Jiva Goswami in presenting the Sandarbhas. The first four are all about Sambandha. The fifth one, Bhakti Sandarbha, basically mirrors the eastern, uh, eastern ocean of uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. First 19 chapters, Nectar of Devotion. And the uh, uh, 
Priti Sandarbha is basically uh, elucidating the rest of the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu and Kujvan Nilamani because it's dealing with Prayojana. But the very, very interesting thing is that in the Sambandha section, the first four books of the Sandarbhas, in the first three books of the Sandarbhas, Jiva Goswami is presenting an argument for the Supreme Lord that's so non-sectarian that even those who are outside of the Gaudiya tradition will be able to accept it. And he only really starts trying to establish Krishna in the fourth Sandarbha, which is known as the Krishna Sandarbha. So you can see that Jiva Goswami, what his inner spirit was, is how can I present this knowledge to the world in a way that anyone can accept it in a non-sectarian way. So are we ever going to write the Sandarbhas? No in one word. But can we take that spirit of Jiva Goswami, that how am I now going to absorb and communicate this way, this knowledge in a way to people that anyone can accept it? That we can do. And you can use whatever tools, whatever intelligence, whatever abilities, whatever Krishna has given you at your disposal to do that. And then you become a Rupanuga, you become a follower of the Goswamis. So we must continue to study the lives of the Goswamis, not because we're ever going to be able to do what they did, but because we are going to become able to absorb their mood, their humility. And we study the lives of the Goswamis because it's humbling. One devotee said to me, if you're not perfect, then you should be humble. And then he said, but the moment you're humble, you're perfect. <laughs> so we study the lives of the Acharyas to become humble. Who am I? What am I? So insignificant, so small. Let me be humble. And then the moment we become humble, we become perfect because we now no longer rely on our limited, weak capabilities. But we say, no, no, I'm just an instrument. Use me. Make me dance. So like this, it's so powerful to hear about the great souls. And ultimately, when we hear about the great souls, we're associating with them. They are present in their words, in their activities. We bring their presence alive by talking about them. And so that great opportunity is given to us. Of course, we would like to know so much more about Jiva Goswami. You see, the other five Goswamis, we know so much about them because they were contemporaries of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had so many biographies written about him that naturally all of the other Goswamis were included in those biographies. So the five other Goswamis, we have a lot of information. But Jiva Goswami, we don't have as much information. Um, but still, whatever we have is enough. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Shri Chaitanya Charitamrita Ki, Shri Jiva Goswami Ki, Shri Lakhupada Ki, Chaitanya Goswami Ki, Shri Lakhupada 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 Ki, Shri